So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's guest photography session. Hi, Nigel. I know you're in the wings. How are you doing? I am okay, Jay, except that you mentioned about technical difficulties. Okay. I seem to have one of my own. Okay. I'm trying to work out what's going on here because when I, uh, I can display my uh, slideshow on my own computer, but when I display it through yours, I haven't given you I haven't given you the screen yet, Nigel, so they won't be able to see your presentation yet. Ah. That's why. Don't panic. It's all good. You okay. should just be seeing my screen with your mugshot on it at the moment. Right. Yeah, but it's not go on. See what let's see what happens. All right, okay. Well okay. just before we get started, Nigel, obviously. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure <laughs> Fine, but we'll fix it if we'll, we'll we'll get that when I give you the screen in a second. Uh, but Nigel, just before I give you the screen and we get into tonight's presentation, just for anybody that's yeah. new with us, just tell us a little bit about yourself and quickly just your journey into photography and how you came to be obviously our landscape master. Yeah, uh, I'm Nigel Forster. I'm uh, as Jay explained, a master photographer with the Photographer Academy. Have been for oh gosh, it's about four or five years now. Uh, based in the Brecon Beacons, uh, run a group and one-to-one. Uh, workshops throughout the year. Um, primarily a landscape photographer, although my photographic work covers sort of interiors, architecture, uh, people in the landscape, and that kind of thing. And it's uh, as a is a is the is the way with uh, with landscape photographers, you have to be kind of diverse in the the kind of work that you that, that you do. Um, so yeah, landscape's my first love, but um, uh, and and I think probably. I like to think of my strength as being uh, use of natural light, strength of composition, that kind of thing, which is primarily what uh, today's uh, talk is on. Um, so I'll be explaining more about that in a minute. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping this displays OK. Well, let's find out then. So I'll, yeah. I'll give you the screen and I'll let you know straight away as soon as what I can see and where we're at. So it's coming over to you now, Nigel. Okay. I'll tell you that I've made you the presenter and I promise okay. you to share your screen. So. I'll, I'll um, leave it with you, and I'll just go quiet. Any any questions for Nigel, please, guys, through the chat panel. Nigel, and I'll, I'll chip in wherever you need me to, mate. It's all yours. Yeah, okay, right. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody, for listening. Now, as Jay's, Jay's uh, once again, apologies for the, the, the hiccup at the start. Um, as Jay explained, uh, this is going to be uh, a little bit in two halves. The first half this evening is primarily about developing your style with photographic composition. So we're looking at largely compositional style in developing your photography. Uh, next week, I'm going to follow it up a little bit more by developing compositional themes, uh, taking a thematic approach, but also looking at the way that you might interpret the landscape and that you might interpret, interpret the land through, landscape through both in camera and also in post-processing as well. So there's going to be a slightly different emphasis to it. Um, so uh, should we kick off? Um, there are some fundamental things, I think, to me, which are really important if you're going to uh, start thinking about photography in compositional terms. Um, overriding question that I like to think about is, why am I taking this picture? Because everything else leads on from that. So during this presentation, I'm going to be posing that question on a number of occasions. I'm going to be repeating that a few times because it's quite relevant to most of the ideas I'm going to put forward. So in simple terms, if I'm going to go through these, uh, go through the key points here, being selective, simplicity, uh, thinking of composition in terms of simple form, simple shape, uh, simple pattern, those kind of things. Whatever you're photographing, you might be photographing a fantastic landscape, uh, a vista, you might be photographing a detail. It doesn't matter. You're basically keeping to compositional theme and idea. So I'm going to be uh, talking in, in those terms. Um, conveying your purpose, how you want to create impact through your imagery, um, how it, you want to make it very clear to the viewer of your picture why you've taken the picture. And that will hopefully come out as well. Compositional balance. A little bit more uh, uh, about judgment required here, a little bit more subjective. What looks effectively, it's more often what looks and feels right. And it certainly isn't about effectively following, if you think about things like the rule of thirds, 
where you put the horizon line, using lead-in lines, all those kind of very familiar compositional tools. It's less about that and more about what feels right to you. After all, it's your picture, actually, and, 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 and fundamentally, that's much more important than following a particular, a particular rule or guideline. And uh, fourthly, which is quite relevant to this particular presentation, it's about individuality. How, how do you create I put the word unique there, but how do you create individual images, images which are yours and couldn't be replicated by anybody else? I went up to um, uh, a very familiar spot in Snowdonia this week, actually. Uh, a number of you will probably know the spot. Uh, it's a, uh, a lake called Slimpadan, just outside Flamberis. And at the end of Slimpadan is a tree. Uh, it's a lone tree, and it's a very familiar theme, isn't it, in photography, photographing the lone tree. This particular lone tree has probably been photographed more than any other lone tree, at least in this country. And I was there at uh, half past seven in the morning. I was on my way to, to Cardigan, uh, not Cardigan, uh, Carnarvon, actually, to photograph the castle. I thought I'd drop in, because I've never actually photographed this tree. There were eight photographers there, lined up to get an identical picture of this tree. I, all I did was take a picture of the, the eight photographers lined up to take, to take a picture of the tree because I thought it was quite amusing and walked off again. Um, and I thought to myself, surely there has to be more to photography than this. It is not about uh, finding out about a great place to take a picture from and then taking a picture of it. And effectively, those eight photographers were going to get identical photographs of exactly the same thing. So what I want to encourage you to do is think very differently than that and try and develop unique images using your own style and certainly not going and replicating effectively what other people are doing. So uh, if I can talk about that into more, in more detail. So shooting for shape and form, not location. Think of your images in, some, in terms of simple style and simple shape and form. Um, the second bullet point there, exploring with your mind and your camera, um, it's be, being creative. I mentioned about the uh, example with the tree. One way of stifling creativity is to look at what other people have done and replicate it and go into locations and replicating a particular picture. It, 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 it blocks you. It blocks the mind from thinking in a more lateral way. So I want you to think about it, how you can explore with your mind and explore through that with your camera and come up with unique and individual images. Um, so back to my question, why am I taking this picture? What's caught my eye? What fundamentally, why is the reason something has caused me to take that picture? Something has made me think, I want to capture this. What is it? And the secret in composition is to make it very clear to the viewer what it is that's caught your eye and how you can use compositional tools to make that very clear. So I'm going to think in terms of image design, effectively how we construct images. Now, I'm going to start off with a few examples, just a few example ideas. Then I'm going to go into some quite familiar compositional uh, guidelines like lead-in lines, like using foreground, in a little bit more detail and look at how you might apply these. Um, I'm also going to go through a number of examples of my own images as well. So these straightforward images, largely location-based. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, a number of parts of the country, three of the reasons these are in Scotland, two are in South Wales, um, We'll probably recognize some of these places, Gower, uh, Elgol on Sky, Glencoe, Fourth Rail Bridge. Um, they are familiar places, nothing wrong with the pictures, they're perfectly okay. And in terms of marketability, um, these will sell quite well because people like popular places um, and they like them photographed, photographed quite well in, 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 in clear light. So, but they're very much location based. Anybody who knows these places will probably recognize where they are. Conversely, if you look at a totally different style of image, though image, those which are based on simple shape and form, 
they're characterized not by where they are in terms of location. Nobody who knows who 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 hasn't taken these pictures would know where these where any of these were taken. Um, but they are more about the lines, the shapes, the light, and the pattern. So it's it's trying to encourage uh, people or you to look for images in this way rather than going to great locations to take pictures from. So how can we think of image design? I've got a number of uh, examples of here, uh, examples here, uh, some landscape pictures and some people pictures and other examples, just to show you how you can think in terms of using uh, an image style rather than what you're photographing. So the two on the top left-hand corner, um, purely using strong perspective lines with a single point at the back. The two on the top right-hand side, uh, a feature top left, bottom right, with a simple diagonal joining the two. Um, you can see that effectively these pictures are designed using a certain compositional style and the main features in the image rather than what, what I'm photographing. The, uh, the style in the top left-hand corner, I've actually also used at a wedding as well where I looked at a, uh, the bride's wedding dress from below looking up to the bride and effectively her head was the single point at the back. Um, haven't used that example here, but it's a very similar style. So you can use these kind of ideas, whatever your style of photography, it doesn't just relate to landscape photography. In fact, one of the uh, people who come to my, my workshops, one of the things I usually take people through is an exercise in looking for simple composition. So you go to an area and look for a few ideas based on um, a theme, for example, cir circles, and just choose a selection of images based on, based on that theme and how you interpret that theme rather than what you're photographing. So it's quite a useful tool. It's quite a useful way of thinking. So. Um, I'm going to go into some of these ideas in a little bit more detail. Now, you'll recognize most of these, um, leading lines and using features, applying the rule of thirds, or maybe you don't, how we use foreground, and how you place the horizon. So there's four quite familiar um, compositional ideas and uh, guidelines, which I've, I'm developing a little bit more detail here. Um, firstly, um, lead-in lines. These can be very direct, they can be very strong, uh, and perspective and diagonal lines do that very effectively. In fact, these take your eye into the picture and out of the picture very, very strongly and very quickly. So these are quite dynamic, these are quite strong lead-in lines. So following this, I've got other examples of the way that we can use lead-in lines as well. So a single curve. Um, as you can tell, these are a different style to the original ones. You'd be surprised how often you can find these kind of features, these kind of curves. Typically, these are used, uh, taken using a wide angle lens, usually close to the ground. I'll explain more about that later on. And usually, with the curve starting from the corner, you can see effectively all of these have done just that. Um, and the curve is made up paving pattern, a path, a river, a, sand, uh, a line in the sand, or a road. A few distinguishing features about this. Uh, the wide angle lens will effectively create, it'll strengthen a curve. If, there, if there's a slight bend in what you've got in front of you, a wide angle lens, lens will accentuate, accentuate that. And it will have a more, a more dynamic effect if you run that curve from the corner of the frame as these are done. Um, Backlighting always help or usually helps as well. Most of these are backlit. Backlighting will create more contrast in your image. So look for these kind of opportunities when you're um, when you're when you're looking for these kind of leading lines. Um, leading lines are often thought of as leading the eye to something. In reality, most of my leading lines tend to be the image in themselves. They are effectively the most dominant feature in the image. Comes back to my question, why I'm taking this picture? Primarily because it's the strength of the line in the picture, not because the line is actually leading to anything. Um, so think about, comes back to that question, 
why you're taking this why am I taking this picture taking that a step further then using meandering leading lines so these have got a different feel to them again they um, rather than having a, uh, a very direct diagonal leading line such as these a much more meandering effect so it's a different style different kind of leading line uh, which adds a different mood to your image as well um, and a finally on these a series of features um, these aren't a continuous line but they have a similar effect they take your eye through the picture in a very similar way either through a diagonal line a um, uh, using a series of features or in the case of the one with the rocks a series uh, a, a, a curve created by the rocks so these effectively are implied leading line leading lines they work in a very very similar way um, the two on the left were taken in a sandstorm by the way I wouldn't ever repeat that again the first one the one on the top left left cost me several hundred pounds in camera repairs and one of my lenses still makes a crunching sound whenever wherever I rotate the lens so uh, something perhaps not recommended unless you totally and fully protect your camera gear these ones are a slightly uh, diff have a slightly different emphasis, but the effect is very, very similar. Effectively, you're arranging features in the frame. Now, all of these very conventional landscapes. They have a series of features that take your eye through the image from front to back in the same way as a lead in line does. But they're more conventional landscapes. If you notice with these, uh, the one with the boat slightly different, but the other four work in pretty much the same way a feature in the bottom left hand corner a feature in the middle right and a feature in the background so the features are arranged that take your eye through uh, through the frame um, think of them think of these images as designing the features in the frame in exactly the way the same way as the other ones there are effectively you're arranging the features in the frame to take the eye through it Um, any questions yet, Jay, or shall I just carry on? Uh, we do have some questions, nice, but they're not specific. They're actually more about uh, sort of uh, the business of landscape photography. So I'll hang on to them if you want, but there are a few. But yeah, I that's think, fine. I that's think we'll fine. crack on for now. But that's so. Okay. Right. The uh, next idea. Um, you'll have all heard, heard of the rule of thirds, or most people will anyway. A very familiar uh, rule. Um, these are conventional, very typical rules of thirds pictures. Um, effectively, what the rule of thirds does is to create context for a main subject. So you're using the main subject to draw the eye towards its background. So all of these, as I mentioned, very conventional rules of thirds pictures. Um, so think about why you're taking the picture and decide whether you want to use the rule of thirds or not. Effectively, as I mentioned, you're creating, creating context for a subject. With a picture on the bridge, on the top uh, left-hand side, that's the old seven bridge, I've actually not placed it on the thirds. Effectively, if you the thirds is designed so if you divide your picture into um, the old uh, noughts and crosses board, where you're using the main subject on one of the intersections the place to put the main subject is one of those intersections but it's certainly not to be used as an absolute the one with the bridge i've actually put the bridge closer to the corner because i wanted to give create an impression of space so i wanted to give the sky more space than the rule of thirds would have done so think about comes back to my question why am i taking this picture i want to give the bridge giving a feeling of remoteness, a feeling of isolation, and that needed a large sky. So that mean, means I wanted the bridge in the corner of the frame, not on the thirds. But the principle is roughly the same. Effectively, you're creating, creating context for a main subject. If I go to these examples, I'm just going to go back to the other two slides in a moment. Now, with these examples, you wouldn't be using the rule of thirds because you want the eye to be taken straight to the main subject. The place in the image which has got the most impact is the center. So with these, whether it's a, a, a rock, whether it's the moon, whether it's Pig Ben, 
currently, currently covered in scaffolding, or whether it's a mountain, all the main features in this and these images are uh, right in the center of the frame because I want the eye to be taken straight to them. So don't use the rule of thirds as an absolute. I've heard people say they always use the rule of th thirds. Well, if you're always using the rule of thirds, it's not clear from your images why you're using it. Comes back to the question, why am I taking this picture? With these pictures, I wanted maximum impact and I wanted the eye to go straight to the main subject. And the best place, best way of doing that to create maximum impact is to put it right in the middle because that's where the eye wants to go to. If I go back to the previous slide as well, um, this one, in this one, the main feature is actually on the third. Uh, it's the main, it's the tree, uh, but it's offset by a strong textural foreground with the grasses. With these two, these set, this is slightly different. Uh, um, both of these have two main subjects effectively, but I've set them up on a diagonal. They're both on the thirds, but effectively you've got two main subjects which are working, they're li effectively linked together. So the photograph, because you've got two clear main subjects, clearly link one with the other. It's a compositional uh, idea, setting them on a, up on a diagonal that I use quite a lot. And it creates a certain dynamic between the two. With these, uh, a little bit like the last slide, you can see the main feature is right in the middle. Exactly the same with these slides as well. These are more architectural pictures, very simple construction. Um, with, um, with, with one main feature right in the middle of the frame and uh, the eye, as I mentioned, goes straight to it. Again, right in the middle of the frame. Um, using foreground, um, so what I'm going to do is explain a little bit more as into how I use foreground um, and the way you can develop an idea using it. So. Uh, conventional um, landscape photographs using foreground and background. Two key things about using foreground. Um, firstly, uh, keep it simple. Um, you'll see that with all these photographs, the foreground I've used is very, very simple. It's either one cut color, one texture, one subject, one pattern. Um, don't try and complicate foreground because effectively you'll dilute the, the message. It's very clear from these images why I've taken them, because it's the, gra it's, the, it's the texture of the grasses, it's the color of the flowers, it's the form of the rock. The second thing about using foreground, don't forget that a low viewpoint will strengthen the relationship between foreground and background. A higher viewpoint opens up the landscape, a lower viewpoint closes the landscape down and simplifies your composition into foreground and background. Very similar with these, um, slightly different emphasis to them, but these pictures are all about the color and texture in the foreground. Now with these ones, um, I've put the horizon line slightly higher because I wanted to emphasize the foreground. These ones are more about foreground texture. So uh, whether it's a, a pattern in the sand, whether it's light and shadow, uh, the emphasis on the foreground of these is the texture and, uh, and it's um, a, a, a very simple uh, foreground pattern. Most of these are backlit as well. As I mentioned earlier, backlighting creates more contrast and it creates a strong light and shadow effect. So you'll often find with these style of images, they're backlit. Um, these ones, um, foreground, again, as I mentioned, very simple in terms of form, shape, or color. And the background's a single point. Now, whether that single point is a single feature, like the rock, the sun, the mountain, or the point of light, it doesn't make any difference. The actual construction of the image is exactly the same. It takes the eye to a single central focal point. Um, so you can see from all these images, the, the, uh, uh, the foreground feature or subject is very, very simple. 
but the main feature is right in the middle of the frame. Um, I've got a set here which are all in portrait format. Um, portrait format is great for two things. Firstly, you get a stronger relationship between foreground and background. So they're actually, it's actually very good for simple compositions. If you look, for example, at the two images, uh, the two black and white images at the top, uh, the one with the mountain and the one with the, co with the cottage, compositionally, they're absolutely identical. You've got a simple pattern in the foreground and, or texture, should I say, and a simple shape in the background. The subject matter is different. One's a mountain and a cottage. Uh, and um, a, uh, a froth in the water, and once a cottage with uh, with a texture of grass, but compositionally are the same. Um, if you want to try practicing simple compositions, a very good way of doing it is to look for a simple a simple foreground against a simple background, um, and do it in portrait format. You get, if unlike landscape format, which creates more context. Portrait format creates a strength, a strength in the relationship between foreground and background. And it's very good if you've got two simple, clear main subjects with the, 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 the texture or color in the foreground and the main subject in the background. Um, just a couple of slides on where you can place the horizon. And there's no absolute here. Um, so I've gone from uh, this picture of St. Paul's in the top of the frame to uh, a different emphasis with the two lower down with the landscape pictures where the horizon line is higher up. So I've gone from very low, the very low one at St. Paul's, because all I wanted was a simple base for the picture a base for the uh, for, for the buildings in the background, um, whereas the conventional landscape ones have got primarily the landscape uh, in the um, in the foreground with a smart with the sky a smaller part of the image. That's because I wanted to place emphasis on the landscape. So where you place the horizon is simply down to the emphasis you want from the picture. Comes back to the question, as I mentioned before, why am I taking this picture? The one with the sheep. I wanted the weight and feeling of the trees on top of the sheep. The one with the um, uh, the reflection of the cityscape was actually taken in Swansea. I wanted an absolute mirror image. So with a mirror mirror image, you really want to put the horizon line right in the middle of the frame. Anywhere else, it looks unbalanced. So um, I think one of the other popular uh, guidelines that you often hear said, don't put your horizon line in the middle of the frame. If your picture is absolutely about symmetry and you want a mirror image, there probably isn't anywhere else to put it. Um, so um, so I, I would in usually, usually in that situation, put the horizon line right in the middle of the frame. Uh, with these, more on horizon lines. I've just added, with two of them, I've added a touch of uh, asymmetry to it. Now, the eye almost expects to see symmetry, and it will instantly be caught by something that that it, that that unbalances it slightly. But I actually sometimes quite like that that element of uh, imbalance in the image. Image with the one at the top, I threw a pebble in the water, um, and just added a ripple. Took a few attempts because the first few, the the ripple didn't happen in the right place to uh, to catch the, the uh, catch the light of the sun. Um, and the one at the bottom right, the swan. The eye is drawn straight to it. As I mentioned, anything that runs in the middle of the frame, the eye goes uh, straight to it. Um, so with these, despite the fact they're asymmetrical, uh, it's, they're very subtle. And I would usually have the horizon line, which keep the horizon line right in the middle of the frame. Um, that would be a natural break point, Jay. Have you got any questions there? I do. Um, uh, where is it? Um, I, I don't think we touched on it yet. We've touched on it obviously in previous webinars. But do you? Uh, what is sort of your go-to lenses? Uh, I think that was appropriate when you were talking about wide angle and that sort of jumped up as one on the right. question panel. Okay. There are there are two um, two primary uh, lenses which I will tend to use. 
a wide angle creates the feeling of depth, space, and perspective. And if you like a sense of drama. So I've got a 1635 zoom in a full frame. Um, and I, I'll often have that at a pretty wide, uh, wide angle um, because it creates, it emphasizes drama, it emphasizes foreground, and it creates a strong sense of perspective. Um, the other one I use quite a lot is a longer telephoto. That compresses perspective, and that creates a very single, a simple two-dimensional effect. So there's a different emphasis to the picture, but almost they're two extremes. I probably tend to use the ones in the middle less because I quite like the almost the exaggerated uh, either perspective or compression created either by using a very wide, wide angle, the 16 to 35, you're often at 16 to 20, or a longer telephoto of around 200 millimeters because you're compressing perspective and you're getting a very clear one or the other as opposed to something in the middle. Brilliant, great. Um, we've had, again, this is stuff that we've talked about in the past, but we haven't looked at it tonight. Um, uh, neutral density filters and filters in general, how, are you using them a, a lot within your work? Yeah, well, um, you, 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 for long exposure images, I've shown a few of them here, they're fairly essential. Um, well, uh, particularly obviously during daylight. So I do use them. Uh, the only filters I ever use are the ones that control and manage the quantity and quality of light, which means effectively a neutral density filter, a neutral graduated filter, and at times a polarizing filter if I want to strengthen uh, the um, color or, or, um, uh, or the through reflective surfaces. So for example, if you've got water under gray skies, you'll see a lot more detail if you use a polarizing filter. So that's the only other filter I'll, I'll, I'll use. I use a very limited range of filters. Uh, leading on from that question, and again, you know, something that we've talked about in the past, and I know you've done this on video for us as well. Um, with regards to, you seem that, that a few people have picked up on the fact that obviously we've seen lots of examples of your work tonight, but there's a lot of, uh, there are uh, examples of long exposures in the skies and in the water. Is that typical? Is that what you would specifically say is, is a Nigel Foster style or do you appropriately do long and, I think, and long exposures where appropriate, where you see it in your mind? Is that I think where, where, where appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah. If uh, you can actually use, I'm going to come, come on to these in a minute, but you can actually use uh, long exposure as a compositional aid. Com com long exposure can radically change composition. Um, uh, the composition makeup of the image. Um, so I would say I use them where appropriate. If I was going to name my favorite photographic, photographic style, it would probably be strong, simple shapes and forms. And actually, I like dramatic light as well. Um, long exposure is something I use, something I do, and where I feel it fits the subject. Perfect. Uh, that's all the questions for now. We, we have more, but I'm going to hang on to those ones. Nice. So you can yeah, okay. on that. All right. OK, um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some very specific ideas, a little bit away from what we talked about before, which was more how we can use general compositional ideas. So um, there's a few comparisons here between uh, three images. Um, I use this compositional idea quite a lot. It's effectively two rectangles. So the top one is a power station. The bottom one has got some poppies underneath a cloud. And the one in the top corner is a piece of wooden and some concrete. But the composition is pretty much the same. Um, trying to emphasize the fact that it doesn't matter what the subject is, it's more about how you use and design what's in front of you. So um, um, you can see in terms of coloring, and in terms of compositional style, those three images are very, very simple. The only difference between them, the one with the power station happens to have the power station or a series of vertical features on the horizon line. So the only difference being there with those three images is how I've treated the horizon line. The other three, the, apart from that, in all aspects, they're pretty much the same. So taking that a step further, um, I've applied that to several examples. So where I've used uh, two rectangles, but the horizon line has been treated differently. 
Um, the one with the trees on the horizon, uh, with the oilseed rate fill and the grade sky. Um, in terms of composition, very, very similar to the one with the power station, the red sky and the boats in the foreground. Two rectangles with the horizon line treated in a slightly different way. The obvious similarity there is also between uh, the picture of the Houses of Parliament and the pictures, uh, picture of the Abbey at the bottom. Um, the idea is effectively the same. But with these, I would usually have a very low horizon line because it adds real weight to the weight to the sky. I would certainly have the horizon line lower typically than than uh, uh, would typically, you know, people talk about a third of the way up, but I'll generally have it lower than that because it adds weight and emphasis to the sky or the uh, the top half of the image in the case of the uh, the one with the, the one with the sheep and uh, 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 and the trees. Uh, some examples in black and white. Again, very low horizon line, emphasis on the uh, on the sky. Um, again, two image, two two rectangles, but the detail is how you treat the horizon line. Um, the one on the top left, by the way, is where I run my sky workshops. It's a it's a fabulous spot uh, right below the, uh, the the mountains. That's actually the cottage I use. Um, these ones, just a comparison between two very different images, uh, both made out of two rectangles. Again, the sheep Im image I've showed you before. And uh, the other one is a isolated little village under a, underneath a very, very stormy sky. They are exactly the same in terms of image style. The highlight is in the uh, either the sheep or the village. The weight or emphasis is on the trees or the sky. The image style is exactly the same. So hopefully you'll see that it's another example of the way you're, I'm using a type of image rather than what the subject matter is. The subject matter couldn't be more different, uh, but the, the idea and the theme is the same. Uh, I've shown you this one before, but it's worth re-emphasizing this slide because this one, the emphasis is different. Uh, the horizon line is higher. Uh, it's still two rectangles, in terms of image construction, but the foreground has got detail in it. So the foreground is the emphasis here, whether it's color, the poppies, the oil seed rate, the, uh, the, uh, the rocks. Uh, therefore, that has emphasis, with the sky perhaps secondary. So I've, the emphasis of this picture is on the primary rectangle, which is the foreground. Um, conversely, away from rectangles using diagonals. Uh, this is something else I use uh, a lot as well. Um, as you can tell, these are a, a variety of pictures from people pictures to, to architecture, heritage, uh, to, um, uh, yeah, actually they're mainly in architecture, aren't they? Um, these are mostly pointed the camera up to the air, actually, they're less about landscape, more about uh, other subjects. But the key thing about these, Diagonals is the main is the main emphasis of all these uh, images. Uh, diagonals again. Um, uh, if you look at the two images on the top on the left hand side, uh, fragmented uh, uh, diagonal. Um, so in that respect, they're quite similar. However, there is a difference between them. The one at the top has got a stop point the uh, woman standing by the um, by the, the top of the mountain. Uh, in that respect, it's similar to the one on the top right, because that also has a stop point, whereas the two at the bottom do not. So with all these use a diagonal, two of them at the top lead to a main subject, the two at the bottom don't. So they almost go to infinity. You can see there's a kind of crossover between all these images, but they all have subtle differences between them. Right, with these, these are quite interesting as well. Um, uh, four architectural images. The two on the left-hand side, one strong diagonal with a series of supporting diagonals leading to them. And the two on the right, um, uh, obviously the diagonal going the other way. But you can see the coloring on the two, bottom two is very similar. The top two are uh, obviously in black and white, but compositionally, these images are pretty much the same, using a strong diagonal uh, with the bottom two, a strong, a strong sing, single uh, bright golden highlight as well. So I've used the same idea for all these images. 
as I mentioned before, mainly these are architectural. You don't find many landscapes up in the sky. But so in terms of architectural photography, I use these ideas quite a lot uh, because they're effective and they're very, very simple to do. You simply uh, orientate the main feature in a certain way. I tend to use diagonals quite a lot in architectural photography. Uh, these ones, the key thing about these images that the compositions radiate from the center. Um, uh, you mentioned, I, Jay, I know mentioned a minute ago about uh, the fact that a lot of uh, my images are uh, using long exposures. This is certainly a case in point. Um, if you shoot against the wind with a long exposure, then and with clouds in the sky, obviously, then you will get cloud movement going towards or away from you. So you can use that as part as a fundamental part of the composition. And what it does is place emphasis on the main feature in the middle of the frame. So you can see, although, um, for example, the uh, street lamp uh, in the top left, Big Ben in the top right, the uh, tower at the end of the Tyne Bridge, none of, the, uh, none of them are, in fact, the person in the middle of the frame. Um, none of them are significant. None of them are big in terms of the space in the frame, but the whole of the picture goes towards them. Therefore, they are they 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 gain a fundamental importance in terms of how the image works. So the center of the image, with all these examples, is very very important. The two other examples, one a waterfall, and the other one is an architectural shot uh, taken in Gateshead, Newcastle near Newcastle anyway, um, everything radiates out from that center. So whether it's the, the, the shape and alignment of the paving or the flow and effect of the sky, everything radiates around that central feature. So in all these images, the center of the frame is really important. And in a number of them, that the fact that I've used a long exposure and, and used either cloud movement or in the, one of the top, uh, top left-hand side, the perspective lines of the planking, all of it lead, leads towards the, the center of the image. Um, these, um, uh, just a brief uh, summary of square compositions, possibly un, un, underutilized because most of our cameras produce three by two or four by three format images. We probably don't tend to shoot square as often as we should, probably me included actually as well, but it can be quite effective. Um, if it comes back to that question of compositional balance. If an image looks compositionally balanced uh, by using square, use a square format. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, long exposures uh, when Jay posed the question about long exposure photography, fundamentally changing composition. This is just a couple of examples here uh, where um, a long exposure has changed the image from a symmetrical composition to a radial one where the center of the frame becomes much more important with a long exposure because of the direction of the cloud movement and its reflection in the water compared to the top images, which are more a simple reflection. So um, you can see that using a long exposure has fundamentally changed the composition of the image. Um, it's interesting to see actually with the two uh, how things quickly can, can, can change so quickly. The two on the right hand side of the Tyne Bridge, uh, they were taken immediately after each other um, actually. So I took the first one as a still single image um, and uh, the um, so uh, with a short exposure, I think it was a few seconds from memory. And the one at the bottom was two and a half minutes, but they were taken almost exactly after each other. So I took one, then took the other. You can see the cloud has filled in a lot during that time. It actually filled in while I was taking the picture. And also the coloring changed. So it's just a case in point that uh, that those nice lights you see at dawn and dusk don't last very long. That uh, red glow actually disappeared in the two and a half minutes that it took me to take the uh, the second image. So if you want to catch colors in the landscape, it can be a very can be a very fleeting thing. Um, Jay mentioned also about uh, in response to a couple of questions um, that uh, that he was asked about whether I define my 
style as being long exposure photography. Um, no, it's not really in some ways. Um, I love simple compositions. I've shown you a few examples so far, far but I do like dramatic landscapes and all of that is actually created, uh, uh, creates a, a quite a, a dark image, but with, with, with key highlights contained with the image. And I've got a few examples here. Um, so um, a few examples of some of my, uh, some of my favorites, um, some more favorite than others perhaps, um, but they're all similar in terms of the fact that they are generally dark in tone, usually shot against the light, um, and uh, in other words, backlit, um, and uh, largely dark with very small highlight areas, often taken in, uh, often but not always taken in stormy skies. You can see the one on the bottom right is taken on a, on a, a, at dawn with the, the sun catching the tops of the mountains was, was taken on a clear morning. Um, so, uh, it, it, but more often than not, I tend to be taking my photographs of this type in quite dramatic stormy conditions with strongly changing light. In fact, I've got a separate presentation on, on light on the landscape and how I use light on the landscape. Um, key things about these pictures, uh, uh, three things. Uh, they're composed, obviously, primarily by how I compose highlights and shadows or effectively light areas and dark areas in the image. So the light areas are usually contained within the frame. That's because um, people are drawn to highlights in the same way is that, uh, that the viewer is drawn towards the center of the frame. Um, you're also drawn to highlights. So having the highlights contained within the frame, therefore it's big for itself that you should have the highlights surrounded by the darker tones. Um, and that's the way these are generally done. And it's generally the way I use highlights and shadows. Um, secondly, use of a graduated filter. Um, Jay mentioned filters a minute ago. Um, with all these examples, as things stand, you'll always need a graduated filter with, uh, with images of these types, typically shooting against the light. Typically, the uh, sky tones are massively brighter than the landscape tones. So you need something to balance the exposure out. And in that respect, a graduated filter is pretty essential for this kind of shot. Um, I'm sure it'll come to a time where we actually don't need a graduated filter because um, all the time dynamic range, both in terms of in-camera capability and in terms of the image process, the, um, the processing of the image software, Photoshop, for example, is improving all the time. So I can see a point where that you can, uh, you know, take a single raw file, get it into your um, software, and um, and you can do all sorts of things with things with it. So I can I can I can I can see in five five ten years time that probably uh, there will be a lessening need for for filtration. But at the moment we still need them. Uh, other examples here um, where I've uh, get they're all backlit. Um, the one on the top left is just a good example of uh, of uh, not necessarily shooting. We've all heard of the golden hour. Don't necessarily use the golden hour. That was shot at, uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon in um, oh, late summer. So, um, you know, it was, uh, the sun was very, very high in the sky. Um, so you don't necessarily need low sunlight. In fact, generally for this kind of shot, the sun needs elevation. So typically you'll be shooting these kind of shots well after sunrise or well before sunset. Same similar, same style of image though. And I've got a few others here where the highlight is more of a band across the image rather than uh, a single point in the image, but uh, in the center, but the same principle still applies. Effectively, it's dark, light, and dark. Um, these images, um, using the same principle of highlight areas, small highlight areas, uh, and larger uh, dominant, shadow areas. But the other thing that unifies these pictures is the coloring. These are primarily blues and reds. Um, so that links all these images together. Conversely, you can have another set of images which are very different in color, has exactly the same image style in terms of small highlight areas, but the colors are much more subdued and they're much more oranges and grays. Um, with these, I've desaturated them 
actually, because originally what will tend to happen with these style of images, like, they can actually come out quite blue out of the camera, more so than you'll see with the naked eye. And what I'll try and do with these style of images is to uh, desaturate the blue. Okay, now, um, I have some examples here. However, however, I think what I'm going to do, it's nearly eight o'clock. I'm going to invite Jay to, perhaps if you've got any questions, Jay, and I'm going to continue this on next week. Perfect, Nigel. No, absolutely brilliant timing, yeah. And if you think that fits for next week, then perfect for that. Yeah, um, it does. Excellent. Well, I've got a, yeah, I've got a few questions for you, not in any particular order. I'll try and work through them and keep them uh, where appropriate together for you. Um, we did touch on it briefly, but could you just sort of run through very quickly this, the typical setup for uh, capturing long exposure? So what you favor uh, filter wise and just give us a rough, just a, just a quick oh. idea of um, how long okay. you know, sort of, I, I know you mentioned like a two and a half minute exposure just now. Yeah, I have actually done it. I probably need to repeat the webinar on long exposure photography, don't I actually? If you remember, yeah, I've actually done yeah, one. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I've actually revised all my stuff as well, actually, so I could easily do another one. Um, yeah. Uh, right. Oh. Okay. Um, tripod. Obviously, the camera has to remain still. Um, neutral density filter. Usually, because usually you're shooting them at least in daylight or enough daylight to mean that effectively you're going to have to reduce the amount of light going into the lens significantly. Now, I use a slot filter system because they're much more flexible. In other words, effectively, you have a holder, you have a, 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 um, an adapter that screws into the front of the lens. You've got a holder which holds the filters and a series of square filters, square or rectangular filters that you slot into the front. Um, that's what I primarily uh, use. Um, usually you'll need filtration and if you're shooting against the light you'll also need to combine a neutral density filter with a neutral graduated filter. So you need to darken the sky but also lengthen the exposure as well. A remote release, typically cameras shoot only up to 30 seconds then you have to go to bulb mode. So uh, you need a mechanism by which uh, you can hold the shutter down. Um, there are an increasing number of cameras have also got what they call a T mode, which means you can press the shutter once to open it and shut it again to close it. And a number of mirrorless systems also go, go up to one minute exposure. However, one minute isn't actually, oh, in a lot of occasions, isn't enough. A lot of my long exposures, I'm tending to go between two and three minutes and sometimes more, which means that you will effectively have to go into bulb or T mode. So even the minute that, uh, for example, the Sony's and the Olympuses do generally isn't enough for a long exposure. Um, so fundamental requirements are um, in terms of uh, equipment, uh, tripod, uh, remote release, a filter system, I suppose more often than not, with the long exposures, I'm using a wide angle lens because often I'm including the sky and to get the drama and impact from the sky, then generally you need to get that strong perspective effect, which is achieved more readily. Uh, this is a real generalization, but achieved more readily with a wide angle lens and its perspective qualities than you will with a telephoto lens. Brilliant. Perfect. You nailed that for me, mate. Brilliant. Um, Okay, so when dealing with um, dynamic range, do you favor bracketing or, la or layering with HDR software? That's a really good question, actually. And, you know, I've tried both. Um, and um, more and more these days, I will still, I will bracket, but actually I'll find that I only need to use one of the images. Um, that the pro imaging software is so good in terms of particularly in shadow recovery in raw, um, but uh, but where I think I'm going to need I'm going to need to bracket um, or I'm going to need to blend images, I actually don't need to because the um, the shadow recovery is so good. Highlight recovery is still not great. The key thing is not to blow highlights, but you'd be amazed, particularly with higher end equipment, what you can do uh, with um, with shadow recovery. Um, it's fair to say that full frame cameras are 
better than crop sensor cameras in terms of uh, data recovery. So in terms of dynamic range, they notice would be better. So certainly, if I was using a crop frame camera, I would uh, I would um, probably be bl blending images. Um, I should point out there is a difference between blending images and and bracketing, uh, because bracketing you're still getting you're not increasing uh, dynamic range effectively. You're only taking a series of pictures, so you, you can capture both the, the shadows in one or the highlights in the other. You would still need to blend them in post processing in order to get the shadows and the highlights contained within the two. So the bracketing is actually a way in which you can have the 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 the, the data to blend images afterwards. So the two rather separate things if that makes any sense. Yeah, brilliant. Great. Uh and make sure I'm going to read this properly. Um referring back to when we we're talking about uh, uh leading lines, uh do you th do you, your personal opinion on whether they work better in a portrait format and do you find that the portrait format weakens the image by denying it the left and right of the viewpoint? Ooh, that's quite a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it really does depend on it honestly and it's a bit of a cliche isn't it but it depends on the subject it depends on the image and it depends on the content and it depends on I think I use the expression what looks and feels right. Um, I, I I think on the whole, yeah. If you're if you're you're using a strong perspective line, running in from the corner, um, you probably do it more often in landscape than in portrait mode. But I've got plenty of examples where I've done it in portrait mode as well. And it really has depended on the compositional makeup of the the elements or ingredients contained within the image. I think actually, I, I, I it's really difficult to be absolute about that. Brilliant. Oh, that's, that's great. It was just again. It was it was your 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 interpretation and your thoughts on that was was the question. Brilliant. Um, I, the last question actually, Knight. Um, top tips for training your eye. Hee <laughs> hee. What a lovely question. What a fantastic question. It is. Isn't well it? done. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well done, whoever asked that question. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned, when I do my workshops. Um, um, I take people out to often take people out to a spot and uh, ask them to choose a theme or I choose a theme for them and um, ask them to take 10 pictures which meet effectively tie in with that theme and that theme could be a color blue or red it could be a pattern it could be squares it could be circles it could be diagonal it could be something which which whatever the subject matter the subject matter is irrelevant that you're uh, you're identifying a certain theme and you're taking a number of images that meet that theme and it helps you to think in terms of shape, form, colour and texture as opposed to what you're photographing. What you're photo photographing isn't relevant. It's, 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 it's the effect of the image. So if I'm choosing circles, for example, I might have a, a part of a road sign. I might have a part of a car wheel. I might have a part of a... Uh, a, a flower pot, a, whatever springs to mind, it doesn't matter. It's the shape and form in the image, and it does help to train your eye when you're try when you're out with your camera to ask yourself, why am I taking this picture? Comes back to that question I've mentioned on a number of occasions before. It's why am I taking this picture? And and if it's take if you're taking it because of a curve, if you're taking it because of a certain shape, if you're taking it because of a, a one dominant color, then being very clear on why you're taking it and thinking in abstract terms helps. And when you've got a moment, just spend half an hour, choose a theme, go anywhere you like and try to take 10 pictures which meet that theme. And it does help you think in abstract terms. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, of all the times I've spent with you and the webinars we've done and me being out filming with you, that's the first time I've heard that one and it's brilliant. So on top of everything else that you normally teach. So I love that. That was a brilliant answer. What I was going to chip in with, and it was from the very first time, and it's going back a long time, like you said now, when I came out filming with you, is one of the things that I took away from actually filming and taking pictures with you was you were, and I think you, you kind of touched on it earlier when you were saying that you went to that place in Snowden and there was eight people taking the same picture. So they'd yeah. gone there with a picture in mind. Last week. But we, <laughs> yeah. but, 
But I was with you, and I can't remember where we were. We were on a mountainside somewhere. I remember it being incredibly cold, and I mean, I remember really, really windy. We were having a nightmare with sound recorded. I remember it distinctly. I couldn't tell you where it was though. And and you, but one of the things that you put out in the film, and I remembered completely. We'd gone there for a specific photograph, but one of the things that came up in your explanation was, okay, so you had an idea for the picture that was right in front of you, but have you looked to your left, and have you looked to your right, and have you looked behind you? And I thought that was brilliant, absolutely brilliant advice um, to, to uh, you know, you, you, it's not just what is ahead of you, you know, scope your landscape. Yeah. I remember yeah. that today. I mean, I've often, I, I have often intended to go to, uh, uh, planned to go to a location and never actually got there. And, and one of the worst things you can actually do is get in the car and drive to a location and stay in the location. And actually, park the car, leave it, and just explore. Because exploring your camera helps you explore with your mind. It really does. I, one of the first few points I made, it actually, I know, as uh, be, I think probably better than anybody, how much my photography declines and deteriorates when I limit it to driving around a car and going to a spot. I know how much it makes, it just makes a fundamental difference. When your photography is reduced to going to places to take pictures from, is it, your, your creativity, uh, cre creativity becomes incredibly stifled and it's not the way to do it. And I know from my own experience, the moment I start doing that, and we all do it, and me too, it get, it's, it's, it's almost a, a, sh a, a shortcut, dare I say it, even lazy approach to photography where you're, you're, you're trying to effectively create dramatic images by, by relying on a tried and trusted formula, by tried and trusted location, and it's kind of easy. And it does stifle creativity hugely. And you often get far stronger images just by going out there, seeing the light, seeing what's around you, seeing what the ingredients are, and coming up with images of your own. Brilliant, great. And I, I don't know whether you agree with me on this. I'm slightly, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I prefer, I do a lot of architectural, as you know, uh, but I absolutely, I absolutely adore uh, the winter sun because it is usually pretty strong at certain times of the day. And I think you get really, yeah, really it is. great contrast yeah, it is. in the winter. So yeah. It's, but yeah, all right, you need to wrap up warmer than you normally would, but usually when uh, I'm out with you, Nigel, we're having to wrap up warm, whether it's in the middle of the <laughs> summer anyway. But <laughs> that's been living in Wales and thinking so on. But um, yeah, there's some, I, I love I love the winter sun, so it doesn't mean things mm. stopped uh, by this time of year without a doubt. Uh, another question just crept in, Nigel, and I think it's a good one. We will have touched on it again in previous webinars, uh, but obviously we've seen a, quite a few um, examples of work tonight that are in black and white. Uh, do you have a preferred method? or do you do you actually see the image in black and white when you're taking it does that make sense it's another good question you got some good ones tonight um uh yeah and i think i think um yeah I, I i usually usually and i would only say usually uh pretty much know whether it's a black and white or a color picture when i'm taking it so um i will be i i, I think i'll i'll know i think yeah it's a black and white shot um i'll always take it in color in the camera, always. Um, don't forget, if you're shooting, I'd always recommend people shoot in RAW, by the way, but if you're shooting JPEGs, all you'll get is a grayscale version of a color picture if you shoot, you shoot a black and white JPEG. Um, don't forget, it's not only light and dark that translate to tones in black and white, it's also colors that translate to tones in black and white. And that's only achieved by processing the image using the available color channels in post-processing. So uh, always shoot in color, always shoot in raw, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then convert to black and white. But on the whole, yes, I would say that 90% of the time, I'm pretty clear whether I'm shooting a black and white or a color picture. Very occasionally, I'll shoot a color one, and I think, oh, I wonder what that's gonna look like in black and white. And sometimes it's okay, but usually the best of them are definitely when I know it's a black and white shot. Um, nearly all, I would say, 80% um, of my uh, long exposure shots are actually black and white because I find it has an effect on tones, which I far prefer the effect in black and white than I do than, than you get in color. Perfect, absolutely perfect, bud. Uh, a couple of things that I want to share with you that I haven't. That there was loads of thanks and praise already in the chat panel, but I've kept these. Uh, uh, specifically uh, another great webinar love Nigel's approach and I'm a big I'll second that I, I always have love you have in line with this uh, this one I really liked uh, this is from Garrett uh, probably one of the best webinars I've ever attended shooting oh, landscapes but thank you very much 
Well, we haven't finished yet. <laughs> Shooting landscapes for over 50 years. This was just fabulous. I can't wait till next week. So on that yeah, note, great. let's just tease them. Despite, this, despite, the, despite the abominable start, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what are we looking at next week, Nigel? Well, we've got them, still got the, their attention bed. I'm going to continue with some ideas, and they are, they're ideas based on specific themes, and you saw a, a brief list there with the umbrellas picture, um, and uh, it's more about um, uh, developing a style through uh, a thematic approach and also through image processing by looking at the way we, how we look at and perceive, perceive the landscape. Perfect. Absolutely brilliant. And even though so I'll, I'll, I'll start by carrying off where I left, uh, carrying on where I left off, brilliant. but I've got some other examples as well. But uh, obviously, you know, guys, if you haven't seen any of Nigel's films or previous webinars he's done for us, there's a massive load of content from Nigel on the Photographer Academy already. Um, and, but uh, it's great how we do uh, in the time that we've spent together, how these often get updated. And I think we should we should definitely, especially with the com co questions we've had tonight, uh, look at the uh, long exposure one for the new year, Nigel. It'd be great. To yeah, I've, I've radically updated. In fact, I've um, I. Uh, I've actually gone through a slightly updated, uh, out-of-date one today. Actually, I've updated it even now. That was going, but that was because go, going from a uh, from a PowerPoint to a PDF. <laughs> so, well, you know, but it's a future uh, okay. reference. And I guess we always look. Even I, you know, I'm using PowerPoint, but the PDF worked perfect, perfectly tonight, mate. So. Obviously, yeah. we always have that uh, in the backup, but uh, brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to that, guys. So if you haven't done so already, uh, the registration is already available on Photographer Academy. Uh, it'll be on your follow up uh, emails and, of course, we'll be putting out more. Oh, don't, don't forget to work, mention the, the workshops, Jay. No, not at all. That was what I was leading up to next. Week, so I haven't <laughs> okay. done. 